All right, topic five, which is evolution and classification. So 5.1 is specifically talking about the evidence for evolution. So before we go into the evidence, we gotta talk about what evolution is. So evolution is the process of um, characteristics of species changing over time. One thing that you is very important to make sure that you understand is that uh, populations evolve rather than individuals. So an individual like you as a human in your lifetime cannot evolve. Um, but the population of humans as a whole over multiple generations can evolve. So just make sure you understand that. And the mechanism for evolution, how populations evolve, is through natural selection, which we'll talk about in a second with 5.2. But, but before we go on to 5.2, 5.1 talks about evidence for evolution. So there are five, sorry, four, I think, pieces of evidence for evolution. Um, the first one being fossils. So we can look at the fossil record. And basically we can look at fossils and establish um kind of a a history of of life this um history of life um is incomplete because you know fossils there are only certain types of organisms which fossilize well like some organisms um because of their structure and the fact that they have a lot of bones um they those types of animals or Organisms fossilize a lot better than organisms that are, um, you know, only have cartilage or like tissue. So a lot of the fossil record is kind of like missing, but we can use uh, the fossil record to kind of figure out the sequence in which organisms have been expected to evolve. Um, the next thing is we can look at selective breeding. So selective breeding is basically artificial breeding. So the biggest thing that you can like think of is like the selective breeding of dogs. So because we have done our own artificial selection throughout like the lifespan of humans, we can see that if artificial selection, you know, causes evolution, then that should show us that, you know, evolution can kind of happen on a, um, like on a natural scale, if that makes sense. Um, there's a lot of really cool examples of artificial selection. Um, I highly suggest if you have time and are really interested into it, you look, um, into, there was a Russian experiment where they basically domesticated wild foxes. Um, and it was, it's one of my favorites. I would highly, I highly, highly recommend you look into it. Um, cool. Third piece of evidence is homologous structures. So in particular, um, IB wants you to make sure that you understand these pentadactyl limbs. So this is essentially the idea or homologous structures are structures that, um, P particularly these limbs, for example, they, there are similarities in like the, the bones, but you can see, um, throughout these different organisms that they have differences in function, but they still kind of look the same and they still have the same, um, bones. Like they still have like the upper arm in humans. They have like, um, the lower limb, and then they have like the wrist bones, um, the hand bones, and then like the finger bones. Uh, and all of those, so in humans, it's our arm. In horses, it's, you know, their front, their front limbs. Whales have like flippers. Turtles have, you know, their little feet, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these look very different but they have, or their function is different. You know, one is for, you know, hopping, one is for flying, one is for crawling, one is for, you know, whatever, swimming. Um, but they all have similar structures when you look at the bones. Uh, and then the fourth piece of evidence is patterns of variation. 
So we can actually look at, this is where you probably have heard of um, a lot of information um, that we got from like the Galapagos Islands. So we were able to study um, a lot of different species on the Galapagos Island, not just the finches, but there are iguanas um, and all kinds of um, organisms that we've looked at. And we can see that these species, like the same organisms that have been separated um, by geographical, geographical isolation, so they are isolated by, you know, in this case in the Galapagos Islands, there are a bunch of islands that have been separated by water. Um, and we have seen that over time, um, originally they were all a part of the same island. And then when the island separated, they eventually adapted to the um, island that they were on. And there ended up being like physical traits that they that were different between the different islands. Um, so, and that kind of geographical isolation, or there's different types of isolation. Oops, there's different types of isolation, not just geographical isolation. There's like reproductive isolation. There's like a bunch that you don't really need to know. But um, when organisms become isolated somehow, um, this is what causes speciation, when two populations of a single species eventually diverge into two different species because some kind of, like, something has happened, like geographical, they've been isolated, you know, maybe there's a mountain or like a volcano that's exploded and it's separated these two um, individuals, or maybe they, um, even they can, like, they reproduce at different times of the year. Um, there's a lot of different examples of speciation that y'all don't need to know, but you need to understand what speciation is. Um, so the Galapagos Islands, you need to know about, like, the finches, um, but then there's also um, an example of peppered moths, so peppered moths have variation um, in their color. They can be these kind of like black, dark moths, or they can be these uh, lighter white moths. And so pollution um, has caused like the darkening of the trees because there is lichen um, that, ha that usually grows on the trees. And lichen is... Um, white if you I mean if you look at any tree you will see lichen um on it and they're usually like patches of like it kind of almost looks like molds um but that's what it is it's called lichen um and so normally there was kind of an even distribution of these two but then because of pollution the lichen started to die off and so we saw an increase in these darker peppered moths because they were the ones that were able to hide from um, predators and they got eaten less often. So 5.2 going into more going into evolution and natural selection a little bit more. So there are a couple of things that have to happen for natural selection to occur. So um, first thing is there has to be variation in a population. So the easiest example is like there are there's a species of fish and there are, they have two different colors, right? They have this green color, or they have this yellow color. But variation could be like, you know, different heights in a pop in a human population. Or in for the example back up here with the moths, we have the darker moths and we have the lighter moths. Um it could be, you know, the size of the beak if we're talking about um, the Galapagos Island finches. So there has to be variation in a population. Uh, the second thing that has to happen is there's got to be an overproduction of offspring. Um, and when offspring, when there are more offspring that can survive, that means that there's going to be competition within the species. Um, so there, there's a competition for resources and not all of them can survive. Or there's a competition between like which ones are more adapted to like hide from their predators, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, and this competition then spurs um, basically what we know as survival of the fittest. So the, the organisms that, are, that have a higher fitness, they're better adapted for survival. And so those are the ones that are going to reproduce and pass on their genetic material. So with our example of like the green fish and the yellow fish, um, the green fish are able to more blend in with their environment. The yellow fish kind of stand out. So their predators are going to eat them. And then what happens over time, over many, many generations, we see um, that there's going to be an increase in the frequency of alleles of individuals that are better adapted to their particular environment. So over time, we're gonna see less and less of the yellow fish and we're gonna see more and more of those green fish, okay? Um, so again, examples, we talked about the finches on the Galapagos Islands um, and the fact that the different islands have different foods um, and different like resources. So um, the bird beaks of the, or the beaks of the finches, if you go to different islands, you can see that there are different types of beaks um, and the beaks are adapted to whatever food is available on that particular island. Um, another example is antibiotic resistance in bacteria. So you can see here, um, if you start off with a population that has no antibiotic resistant bacteria, um, and so you can get antibiotic resistance, um, it can be received from another bacteria in the, or bacterium, since that's the singular, in another population, or there can be a mutation in one of the bacterium. So then you end up having some antibiotic resistant bacteria in a population. Um, the antibiotic is used. So all of those that are not resistant are gonna, uh, all of those bacteria that are not resistant to the antibiotic that are gonna die. And those that are, um, are resistant are going to survive and be able to, to reproduce. Um, so there's going to end up being a population with more antibiotic resistant bacteria. And um, yeah, cool. So that's kind of the basics. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons why we can see this an antibiotic resistance in bacteria um, is because bacteria... Um, they're able to reproduce very, very quickly. So this is why antibiotic resistance is like a really big issue is because bacteria um, can generate and reproduce very, very quickly, which is why it's such a problem in like hospitals and such. All right, here is the fun one, 5.3, classification of biodiversity. So you need to make sure you understand the binomial system. Um, the credit was given to a scientist called Carl Linnaeus. Um, he had this, I don't know if you have learned a lot about him last year, but he had this kind of like crazy idea. He had some crazy ideas about evolution just in general. Wasn't a super great guy, but very, very interesting dude. Um, you'll definitely learn about more about him if you ever take like an ecology class or evolution class. Um, because he's kind of known as like the father of evolution. But, um, well, one of the fathers. He's definitely known as, he's definitely credited for the um, idea of the binomial system. So this is the idea. And the reason why the binomial system came about was basically, you know, if you live in America and you are trying to coordinate with a scientist in China, and you know you're working together with another scientist in peru all three of you have three different languages which means that you're trying to call this you know let's say you're trying to study like a some type of like tortoise or something um y'all all have three different names for this particular tortoise so the binomial system is basically a system that is used all around the world all throughout the scientific community. Therefore, we have like the same system 
um, that's used today. Even when we find like new organisms, this system is used. So they have, each organism has a Latin name and that Latin name is actually two names. Um, it's the genus and the species. If you're just writing it, um, like if you're just writing it on and it's not typed, then you should underline it like I did right here. Um, and here's an example, Homo sapien. It's underlined. If you were actually typing it out, it would be italicized. But, you know, we you shouldn't italicize written word. So the other thing that you need to remember is the first letter of the first word is capitalized. And the second word, first letter, is lowercase. And then you don't really see this very often, but if we were to shorten it, um, you could just put like H sapien. Am I spelling this right? No, I think I am. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, so that's like the shortened version. Like when you hear about E. coli, that's the shortened version of the um, bacteria. Okay. Cool. Three domains. We have bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. So bacteria and archaea. These are our prokaryotes. So bacteria is a prokaryote. Remember, prokaryote um, means that it is, pro means no, so no nucleus, okay? And it's just kind of our typical bacteria that we're, like, familiar with. Archaea is interesting. They're also prokaryotes. Oops, sorry, I don't know why this is working. Prokaryotes. Um, but they're fun prokaryotes. They like, um, they are found in like harsh and extreme environments. Extreme environments only. Um, so thinking like hot springs, um, or like uh, living like on or near a volcano, um, like down in like the vents in um, very deep waters. Um, this is gonna be your archaea. Um, they're fun, they're fun guys. Just kidding, they're not fun guys because fun guys are in your karyota, oh my gosh. So these are your um, eukaryotes. So they do. U means do. So they do have nucleus. Do have nucleus. Okay. So here's where we get to the fun part. Actually, we're going to talk about dichotomous keys real quick. But um, the focus pretty much for the rest is going to be focusing on eukaryotes um, for the rest of 5.3. So before we go into all like the phyla and the classes, um, you do need to know how to use dichotomous keys. So just to kind of show you very quickly, this is a dichotomous key, I think for um, like aquatic mammals is what I'm guessing. Um, so let's, I'm just making this up, but let's say we wanted to um, find a dolphin. Like let's say we we had a picture of a dolphin or an um uh, Gosh, I don't know why this is not working. Uh, we had a picture of a dolphin or like an explanation of like what a dolphin looks like. So if we were trying to figure out um, like if we had an unknown organism that we actually is a dolphin, um, we could look at this picture and we would say, okay, it does have, it's, uh, we would have to decide between the first one. So four and hind limbs visible can emerge on land only four limbs of visible cannot live on land. So dolphins don't have limbs, or they have four limbs but not hind limbs. So we would go to number six. Number six says mouth breathing, no blow hole. That's not true. Dolphins do have blow holes. 
So it says breathing through blow holes. Okay, we go to number seven. Number seven, two blow holes, no teeth. Mm, no. One blow hole in teeth. Oh, here we go. Dolphins, porpoises, and whales. There you go. So that's like a very, very quick uh, refresh of dichotomous keys. That should be easy, but, you know, just, just check in. All right, here's the fun part. Um, plant phyla. So there are four main plant phyla that you need to know about. I'm going to make this really small. Okay, so we have bryophyta, uh, philochenophyta, cenophyta, I know I'm saying that wrong, uh, coniferous, and then angiosperms. So bryophytes are your mosses, okay? These are mosses, okay? They are the non-vascular plants. So it says right here, vascular tissue, no xylem or phloem. So these are non-vascular, okay? Um, out of the four, they're the only non-vascular. Okay, so that's like the big dis difference. So again, they don't have a xylem or a phloem. The mosses, um, for example, they are like, usually they're attached to rocks and they have these um, rhizoids, rhizoids, sorry. Um, so instead of roots, they have these kind of like simple stems and leaves. Um, the rhizoids kind of even, they're very similar to roots, but they, it's basically just what is able to kind of cling on to the rock so that it can grow on like a rock or some other surface. So those are mosses. Um, they also, I don't know if it's written here, um, but they reproduce um, using spores. Um, I don't think that's written, but both these two babies, um, the ferns as well, um, they're, they reproduce with spores. So the philogenophyta, which I know I'm saying wrong, but these are the ferns. Um, so they do have, they are vascular. Okay. Um, they don't produce pollen, no ovaries, no seeds, no fruits. Um, they use spores. Okay. And they usually kind of like, they kind of look like the ones that I drew earlier where they have kind of like, um, like double leaves, this kind of look. Um, but yeah, so if you see a fern, then that's what it is. Um, okay, so then we have conifers. Conifers and pines. Technically, these are pines too. Um, so... Conifers and pines, they're vascular. Um, they have cones. They have male cones and female cones. So when you see a pine tree, there you go. They also have like, um, uh, like they have pines essentially. They have like these long like needle-like leaves that are waxy. Um, and then we have angiosperms, which are a fancy word for flowering plants. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they flower. They're the plants that flower. They're vascular. They have flowers. Um, they produce fruits. And that's what they are. Um, honestly, if you can just remember... Like, this is honestly, if you just sit and think about it for a little while and you can remember these four, it's really not too, too difficult. Um, but yeah, so this is where I, I, it's a lot. I know it's a lot. So going on, so that was plants and now we have to talk about animals. So first we're going to talk about invertebrates. Um, invertebrates, hopefully you know that the, these are the um, phylums that do not have a backbone. So um, we have periphera, we have nadaria, platyhelminthes, mollusca, or mollusks, um, annelida, and arthropoda. So periphera 
are your sponges, okay? Um, they don't have a mouth or an anus. Um, they can actually use their pores um, all throughout their surface, and that's how uh, nutrients and water are able to, like, filter in for feeding, and, you know, that's how it gets rid of waste. Um, and I like to think of, like, pores and periphera. That just makes sense to me that they, like, sponges have a lot of pores, periphera, um, yeah, there, the other thing that you need to make sure you understand is there's no symmetry. They do not have symmetry. Um, all right, then we have nadiria. So these are your jellyfish, your hydras, um, like your sea stars. So this is, um, I'm not, this will make sense in a second. So these are the only ones that have radial symmetry. So you can kind of, basically it means that, woo, um, they have like multiple, oh gosh, what did I just do? I did something crazy. Okay, um, so you can kind of cut it multiple, what it means is if I were to like cut this, in, I could cut this in half in like multiple directions and it would still be equal on both sides. Kind of freaky. Um, but that is like radial symmetry. Um, so let's see, they have a mouth only. They don't have an anus. So the mouth is where the food goes in and the waste comes out. That's fun. Um, Jellyfish and like sea stars and sea anemones are kind of like the big one and corals, okay? Platyhelminthes is a, essentially a type of worm. We have flatworms and tapeworms. They have bilateral symmetry. So if we have our like little wormy worm, um, we could, that means we could bisect them, cut them in half, um, and they would be symmetrical on both sides. Uh, they're soft, they don't have a skeleton. Um, basically, the biggest difference between platyhelminthes um, and Annelida oh, uh, is that Annelida, um, these are also worms, but they are segmented. So segmented worms. So like your earthworm would be an analyta. Platyhelminthes, no segments. And segments, of course, when I talk about segments, like if you look at a if you look at a earthworm, you can see that it's like segmented. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, then we have mollusks. So these are your, um, your squid, your octopus, your snails. They also have bilateral symmetry. Um, yep, they're just, they're, um, yeah, they're mollusks. Uh, and then we have arthropoda, which are like our insects. So again, they have bilateral. Um, they have an exoskeleton. They have like segmented bodies and they also have like segmented and they also have like joints between their sections. So it's insects, but also like crustaceans. So like your lobsters and your like crayfish um, are, also, are also arthropoda. All right. And then we have our um, chordata classes. So chordata is technically the last phyla within animals. Um, chordata is a phyla um, and chordata stands for the vertebrates. So all of the vertebrates are in one phyla or this is a phylum technically. Um, so within the chordata you need to know these these particular classes. We have the bony ray finned fish. There are multiple type of fish you need to know about the bony ray finned fish. We have amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Um, 
So bony ray fish, they're essentially the fish. They don't have any limbs. They have fins supported by rays. Um, they have external fertilization. So they lay eggs. Um, the female lays eggs and then the males come by and they release the sperm. And that's how fertilization occurs. Um, and they also have a swim bladder so that they can go up and down in the water. Um, amphibians are, amphibians are really cool. Um, amphibians, and Miss Schaefer knows all about amphibians. Feel free to ask her, she'll tell you all kinds of weird stuff. But amphibians are really cool because they're kind of like the bridge between fish and reptiles. And they're, and mostly because they're like semi-aquatic. So they have some like really cool features. So like, for example, they still have external fertilization. They actually, a lot of them, for example, like frogs, right? Um, they start off as, um, you know, being in the water. Um, and they have like these larval stages that live in the water. And then by the time that they're adults, they live on land. So like salamanders are amphibians as well. Um, so, they have external fertilization, but they have, um, they also, it's really cool, they have these, like, soft, moist skin, and they can actually, um, like, breathe through their skin, um, and they do have a, they don't have, like, they have a very simplified version of lungs, um, and actually it, you, the, the lungs, so when they're like tadpoles, when they're in their larva stage, they have these kind of like s swim bladders. And then when they are, you know, when they're adults, those swim bladders kind of become like these very simple lungs. It's very interesting, very cool. Um, then we have reptiles. So reptiles have like scaly skin. Skin covered in scales of keratin. Oops. Okay. Um, they do have lungs. Um, and then we have, we start to see um, internal fertilization. So they do lay soft, they lay eggs with soft shells. Okay. Um, and they're all three of these. Do not main, d maintain constant body temperature. They're essentially cold-blooded. And then we have our two warm-blooded. We have birds and mammals. So birds have lungs. They have feathers. Two legs, two wings. Um, females lay eggs, but they have a harder shell. And then we have mammals. They have hair. They have lungs. Um, four legs and live young cool <sighs> okay last thing that we're going to briefly talk about is cladograms so essentially you need to be able to like create i mean there was a question if you remember on the mock exam there was a practice question about like creating a cladogram and i think it even gave you like two i can't honestly i can't remember um it might have been like reptiles, birds, and mammals. So we can do an example like this in just a second, but with cladograms. So the things that you basically need to know, um, so these like where the, um, well, yeah, where each of the groups kind of combine, we call this a node, okay? So you may hear me use the word node sometimes. So like this is a node, um, this is a node. Okay, all of those are nodes. And then we have like, so when we have like these two, these two guys, um, primates and rodents, they are known as a clade. Clade, but here's kind of the weird part. So the, they share a clade and they have uh, this kind of common characteristic, which is hair and fur. So this right here, rodents and primates, is a clade. But we can also think of, if we wanted to go bigger, we can also think of like all of this is also technically a clade. If we grouped all of these together, and we like, you know, like this is also a clade, okay? And then technically, 
if we're looking at this amniotic egg clade, then the fish and our amphibians would technically be called an outgroup. Group. I can spell, it's fine. Um, so yeah. And I'm just gonna erase this because um but um what else? What else do you need to know about cladograms? Um Another thing that you will definitely get questions that'll be like, okay, what is, like, here's a cladogram. What is true about this cladogram? So two things that you need to make sure you understand, like rodents and primates, they share a, a node right here. So they are like the most related to one another, okay? They are very closely related because this is their common ancestor. They had a common ancestor not too long ago. Um, if we looked, however, if we looked at primates and fish, we would say that they are least related from each other because their common ancestor was like down, all the way down here with like vertebrates. So um, the last kind of thing, I mean, there are some like few other kind of sprinkling things that they talk about within like the, um, this is technically 5.4s, like clades. Um, but also remember that like cladograms can change and we can reclassify organisms. And normally when that happens, when we like reclassify something, we're looking at, so reclassification, reclassification. So when we classify things in general, um, we're either looking at their structure like what they look like, you know, what their bone structure is like, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then we can also look at like their evolutionary relationships. Evolutionary relationships. Um, so I actually took a uh, evolutionary relationship. So I actually took a class with a professor who was trying to make a basically a he was trying to make a specific type of cladogram called a phylogenetic tree, but he was trying to create a phylogenetic tree of like literally all of the everything that has been every organism that's been discovered. Um, and he was doing that through looking at structure, but also evolutionary relationships, like looking at essentially like the DNA and comparing DNA of different organisms. So when we um, look at the DNA of different organisms, we can potentially reclassify certain organisms if we find out that their DNA is more similar to, you know, another group than we originally thought. So that's basically what you need to know about topic five. You're welcome. Goodbye.